All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is Thursday, April the 11th, and we're doing a session today that is tangentially related to the soft skills. Well, it's related to the soft skills uh, of uh, real estate, that being negotiation. Uh, as many of you are aware, short of lead generation, probably negotiation is the most important aspect of our collective jobs. Um, and so I'm very glad to be speaking on this today, though we're not speaking about any general or specific legal principle as we normally do in this group. So this is going to be a bit different. Uh, before I get into it, a couple of caveats. The normal ones apply. First off, our groups are private. This session is public. Anything you say uh, can appear on public forums. Be advised of that before we begin. Uh, second, um, be advised that... Um, we are going to have some great sessions coming up actually this month. Uh, we are having um, Ben Singer, who's going to be presenting on new builds, specifically tarry on schedules um, and how to understand them uh, and a whole bunch of contractual terms. Uh, really excited for that. I'm very, very grateful. He's an expert in the area. So it's going to be his first time presenting. Greg Whedon will be presenting with us this month to update us on new case law as well. So look for those things. Uh, it's all coming our way. Um, and I have one or two others that are also coming our way. Uh, so we're setting up our spring sessions. Um, this will hopefully kick it off. Um, last I, I'm going to issue a bit of an apology in the last minute that I have before I have to get the substance. Uh, an apology twofold. One, I've had to postpone this from last week. So thank you for all of those who uh, are now here um, and put up with the rescheduling at the last minute. And two, and this is incredibly unfortunate, and I will share my screen for a sec. Two, this is going to be more of a verbal thing because I had an entire, I actually have worked pretty hard thinking through this. And I have a whole slideshow, and I don't know why, but my slideshow is corrupted. Um, and it is incredibly frustrating because I have spent a bit of time putting this together. And um, really, all you're missing are the cartoons and the humor that I actually have found online to give effect to the words that I was going to speak anyway. So you're still going to get the words. But unfortunately, my presentation, I don't know what it is. It's the background has just been corrupted and, and I can no longer access it. Of course, I discovered this only five minutes before entering here. So please excuse that. So instead, you're going to hear the melodious sound of my voice. It's now 10.05. Let's begin. So in some ways, I'm a bit intimidated by providing this particular session because unlike law, uh, where that is my job, and it's my job to kind of be an authoritative voice because I'm a lawyer and I'm speaking and people are asking me legal opinions and I give legal opinions. Negotiation is something that all of us do, particularly everyone on this channel. In fact, this is how you make your daily bread. Um, all of you are going to be familiar with the basic concepts that I'm talking about. Um, and so the real question that we should begin with is what can you expect to get from me blabbing on about my experience in negotiations? And I would say there's two different things that you can learn here. One, um, particularly if you're an agent, a lot of your negotiations, even though you do it every single day, are collegial. Uh, that is to say, you're both trying to achieve the same end. Yes, you may have contrary interests with regards to price, but ultimately you want the same thing. Um, legal negotiation is not necessarily that. In fact, it's more adversarial. Uh, or it's often adversarial. It's not all, not always. We often want the same thing, but it's often adversarial. And because our office does quite a bit of volume, I'm involved in uh, what I would call adversarial negotiations probably two, three times a week where there is like contrary opinions and we're butting heads. And those have slightly different skill sets. But not so different that you won't recognize it. And frankly, you've been in adversarial positions before. And so I actually think that what I'm going to say today is going to have more relevance to you because you'll be able, as without the best of adult learning, to contextualize whatever it is I say and say, oh, yes, that makes a lot of sense based on the experience that I had in this scenario or this scenario. So I'm very well aware that you're all pretty much experts in negotiation. And so I am going to try to contribute those things that perhaps you internally know but have never really called out um, and properly identified in an effort to kind of make you a better negotiator as you kind of go through. I see negotiation as my core skill set. Um, I see um, dialogue, I, I see 
teaching and negotiation as the things that kind of set me apart. And so I think very, very hard and deeply about how to negotiate. And I'm going to start with 13 tips that I kind of have assembled. The first tip, and you would see it on my slides if my slides were working, but again, you're just going to have to hear the lovely sound of my voice, is your positioning. It is incredibly important to ultimately understand how you begin your negotiations, because there is a truism that from nice, you can always go mean, but you can never go from mean to nice. It is the case that when people are gearing up for a fight, even a fight that they know they are going to have, that is to say, this is not going to go well, we are going to be in butting heads and loggerheads here. A lot of people approach it from the perspective of um, if I'm going to fight, I'm going to try to show them I'm the biggest, meanest person on the block. And I don't find that that's necessarily an effective strategy because there's a percentage of people who do not take well to that. They either may be intimidated by that or alternatively, um, they plain don't, they, they just have their back up to idiots and jerks or people who take aggressive tones. And as a result, starting a conversation nicely, even one that you know is going to be adversarial is important. Firstly, on a professional basis, it sets a proper tone that says, hey, I have experience at this. This isn't roiling me. And this is about our clients, not about our professional relationship. And so it sets a more professional tone when you're able to laugh and joke a little with the other side before kind of getting to business. Uh, but more importantly, because there is a percentage of people, and I'll talk about this later on today, that are adversarially based and find order in chaos. And we'll talk about that. Um, because that's the case, you can always revert to something meaner, more difficult, more, um, more aggressive. Um, try to be aggressive. Any of you who have kids, if you start yelling at your kids, going back to a nice state of order is much more difficult than starting nice and then generally raising the temperature. So first tip that I have is begin your negotiations nicely. Begin them with kindness, begin them with affability, and prepare to move into a defensive crouch and fight position as necessary in your tone and in your manner. I'm gonna stop for a minute. Does anyone have any questions about point one? And then I'm gonna to move to point two. Okay. The second point that I've learned in my negotiations, and this came right from a clinical psychologist, and it was one of the most brilliant pieces of advice I have ever been given, and I've been internalizing it my whole career, is to learn how to deliver negative news. There is a world of difference between turning to someone after they present to you what is their critical point that you need to refute and saying to them, no, we don't agree, or go away, or no, here's our position. And my first inclination is to say no. Let me think about it and revert back to you. The reason the difference between those two statements is respect and cordiality. It is the case that even if you know you're going to say no, Showing someone that you are ready to consider their positions, think about them, whilst preparing them for the no. So it's my initial inclination is to say no, but let me think about it and get back to you. While preparing them for a no means that when you get back to them with a the no, A, they're not. it's not a surprise. They understand where your head is at. But it also shows deference to their positioning and gives credence and importance to their side. Respect is an important component of negotiation because whether we like it or not, many of us when we're in the heat of negotiation see this as our, um, our uh, Gettysburg. We see it as, okay, I'm now performing, like this is it, I need to show that I can make do. And showing respect for another side allows for um, people to save face, and it allows for gradualism 
and nothing goes kind of off the rails anytime soon. Now, remember, it's not just saying no. If you have to give up a concession, and you know you're going to give up the concession, stating to someone, you know what, that's a big concession. I'm going to think about it and get back to you. Playing for time in negotiation matters. Because if you just give someone something and say, yes, we accede, then there's been no fight. People, humans have the need to see that other people are struggling. It's the same concept as buying a house. If there are more people who are saying, hey, I want this, then suddenly it becomes more appealing to you. And if someone has to show that they're fighting and struggling to accept one of your sides, it's more of a win for you. These things matter. And as a result, merely giving in to a concession, even if you know you're going to give in to that concession, without saying, you know what, that's a good point. We're going to really take this home and we're going to see what we can do. And then do nothing. Just sit back. And then, you know, after after a day or so, call them back and say, you know what? We struggled with this. We had a lot of discussions. We're ready to do this. That is a better concession than just saying yes. And again, this is about delivering responses and using time to great effect. You can deliver both negative and positive effects. But ultimately, showing that you're struggling and that you're thinking and that you're engaging produces a better outcome and makes the other side more amenable to dealing with you and giving you something in return. I'm going to stop for a second. Does everyone understand point two? Do you want to ask any questions about that? Okay. The next thing I'm going to bring up, my point three is because we are usually negotiating on behalf of other people. Do not, under any circumstances, let things get personal. And I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about for your clients. The number of times every one of you has heard your clients say the following words. It's not about the money. It's personal. It's insulting. You know exactly what I'm talking about. What you need to do as a negotiator corralling your side is immediate if anyone ever says that to you you immediately unless you're in family law you immediately look them in the eye and you say it's not about the money it sure as shit is about the money this is not personal i'm not letting you take me down the road where it is personal because solving for personal affront is much harder than solving for the business point that you are negotiating every time. And if someone chooses to make something a personal vendetta and say, this is about me personally being offended, your work will be six or seven times as hard. One of your chief roles as a negotiator representing another client is to ensure that your client never ever says the words it's personal or if they do you immediately pull a sidebar and say oh no oh no 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 i've done this many times you are not going to make this personal this is about a win we've defined your win we know where we're going and that's what this is about plain and simple please never let your clients make things personal now that's not to say that they won't make it personal that's not to say that some people don't go off the deep end I'm saying to you, to be an effective negotiator, you should be aware that if it ever starts start sidetracking there, you're bringing it back on. It doesn't mean you'll always be successful at that. But if you're doing that every single negotiation, you'll have more success in your negotiations on average than you won't. Please don't let things get personal. Make sense? Point four, once something is offered, it cannot be taken back. It's really critical, particularly when you're new in this field or in the field of negotiation. You often come into a negotiation knowing what it is you'll give up. And it is the case that you will regularly, in an effort to have reciprocality, throw it on the table quickly. After all, we're all raised in nursery schools where our teachers tell us 
This person gave you this, therefore you give this, right? We learn about recipro reciprocality. We learn about meeting in the middle. We learn about if I do X, you're going to do Y. And those people who are not necessarily versed in negotiation will therefore have a tendency to throw what they know they could throw on the table in an effort to see, because that's their X, in an effort, effort to see the other side's Y be thrown out accordingly. But unfortunately, particularly if you're dealing with someone who's versed in negotiation, the rules of nursery school do not apply to negotiation. Skilled negotiators understand holding back their cards. And there are ways of ultimately introducing what it is that you're ready to part with without putting them on the table. One way, as an example, is if you know that someone really wants something that you have, you could say, now, can you tell me what's really important to you? Get them to mention that and say, oh, that's interesting. You know, we never really thought about this. Hmm. Well, you know what? Let's 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 circle back to that in a minute, because that's that's a that's a very interesting point that you've made about wanting this. You know, what we really have wanted is this. Do you think that those things are equivalent? Now, note, I haven't thrown it on the table. What I've done is I've gotten them to identify what it is that I'm ready to throw on the table and then found an equivalency such that before anything has been offered, we are trying to figure out our relative values. It's a critical component in negotiation and understanding that you can talk about things you're ready to give away without giving them away is the hallmark of experienced negotiators. I'm going to stop for a minute. Anyone else have any questions so far? All right. This brings me to point five. Negoti in negotiations, it is not a concession unless everyone understands it to be a concession. What I mean by that is as follows. If you go ahead, uh, sorry, just give me one second. There we go. If you go ahead and say to someone, oh, yeah, 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 um, here's a... Uh, I'll give you I'll give you Tuesday nights because you're arguing about times. And you just say, yeah, Tuesday nights and sure, I'll take Monday. And Tuesday night is a really big thing for the other side. And Tuesday night is a big thing for you. The way that you just gave that as a concession will get you no points at all. Negotiations are about points. After all, the human element is a critical component of what we're talking about here. And unless someone understands that you are giving up something, then that nursery school inclination of forcing them to give something up doesn't actually play out. And so every concession that you do give out in negotiations should be recognized as such. Generally, when you're up against adversarial parties, and I'm going to talk about adversarial parties, but when you're talking about adversarial parties in negotiations, what they do is they have a tendency to minimize any of the concessions you make. And so you can sit there and say, look, you really want to Tuesday nights? Okay, we're going to put Tuesday nights on the table. And what they will say is, great, but you know, you didn't really address this and this and this. And you say, no, 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 no. I will point out to you that I'm giving you Tuesday nights here. And if you don't want them, tell me. But the way you've just glossed over that and moved on to point C and D doesn't make me feel that you actually are appreciating the fact that we're giving up something that means a lot to us. So I want to pause what we are dealing with here and specifically note that Tuesday nights are being given to you. Does that register? Calling an adversarial party out such that they understand the concession and acknowledge the concession is a very smart thing to do. Because then, if fundamentally things break down later on, you can revert back and say, remember, I gave this to you. And it won't just be a blasé thing, which is what your adversarial steeped in negotiation partner is trying to do. 
they're trying to minimize your concessions, you should be trying to maximize acknowledgement of your concessions. Does that make sense? Okay, gonna just pause. Anyone have any questions so far before I move on to my next point? All right. It's always, the default in negotiations is we're gonna meet somewhere in the middle. This is thus the position of anchoring. I wanna get 50, so I'm gonna start at zero. You're gonna start at a hundred. Boom, we'll meet at 50. But with adversarial parties particularly, with people who love negotiation and thrive in it, it's very hard to meet in the middle in that respect. So let me start with adversarial parties for a bit. It is the case that there is something called the 80-20 rule. This is a rule I made up, but you don't see it online. 80% of most people that you deal with are affable. They are amenable to compromise. They understand the nursery school principles of you've given something, I will give something. They smile, they laugh. They don't introduce themselves, nor do they want to be known as idiots or bastards. They are the people that you expect and that you regularly deal with. 20% of the world is not like this. And it's not because they're maladjusted. 20% of the world are idiots. 20% of the world are aggressive, aggressive negotiators. And the reason they're aggressive negotiators is because it's a tactic that they find work. And this speaks to the basic human concepts of chaos and order. It is the case that most of us thrive in a condition of order. That is to say, I understand where my next security is. It makes logical sense to do this. I'm going to go ahead and do this as a result. But there are a lot of us in this world who thrive in chaos, who understand that though chaos doesn't necessarily have a discernible path, other people are less comfortable in a chaotic environment than they are. And because of their upbringing or because they've learned these traits, find that that offset of the footing of their opponents more than outweighs the fact that they themselves are traveling through a disorderly path. And as a result, those actors try to create chaos. They try to create chaos in negotiation. About 20% of the population does this. Some of it do some of people do that through outright aggression. Some of them do it through just nonsensical, what seemingly nonsensical negotiation, where they just don't respond, they don't give you back, they walk away at, at inappropriate times, they call you names, they do crazy things. It seems crazy, and you call your friend, you go, I can't believe what this person did, but actually it makes logical sense in negotiation because what they're doing is they're saying to you, I understand chaos. I thrive in it. I know 80% of the world doesn't. I'm going to assume you to be one of the 80%, and thus I'm going to create a disorderly negotiation space where I have already learned for many decades how to thrive and throw you off guard. When you deal with someone who is aggressive, it's funny. Um, so Tamara's asking, how do you deal with someone who starts the negotiations aggressively? I have a singular rule. First of all, A, I hope you all become comfortable in chaos over time because you have to deal with 20%. And no, Jack, it's not Krav Maga. That's the answer. <laughs> that could work. The way to deal with aggressive behavior is to show that you are comfortable in chaos. Taking out a baseball bat and hitting someone in the face hard when they themselves are veering with a baseball bat takes that 20% down to about 2%. Because if a chaotic actor who understands that other people are not comfortable in chaos, realizes that they're dealing with an actor who is comfortable in chaos, then the advantage that they are seeking through chaotic action and through aggression is negated. And they are brought back to the table of negotiations. 
Sometimes these people just want to see if you have those chops. Sometimes it's just about testing you. And as a result, I have found, particularly when dealing with aggressive people, I always start nice, but if they display aggression early, they will find that they are met with aggression so that they understand that we can do this in two venues, equally comfortable with either chaos or order. But if they want chaos, they sure as heck are not going to be dealing with someone without a baseball bat themselves. That's how you deal with negotiations that are aggressive from the outset. Now, this is difficult for a lot of people. I'm not trying to tell you that this should be something that's comfortable for you, particularly if you're part of the 80% and you've actually had non-aggressive negotiations your whole life. It's very difficult to do, but it is a learned skill and it's a skill you should put on your agenda and identify as a skill. Learning to negotiate in chaos, becoming comfortable with that because mastering that final 20% puts you in control of nearly all situations that you encounter as part of negotiations. Does that make sense? I'm gonna pause. Does anyone have any questions? Now, let me tell you how I actually deal with adversarial actors that remain adversarial after you've displayed that you are good in chaos or irrational actors. Because as all of you are aware, sometimes you just encounter people who are acting with irrationality, either because they genuinely don't care about the outcome, in which case they're just like, eh, screw this, I'm not treating this seriously, or because they're genuinely irrational. What do you do? Well, first of all, there is an expression that is taught to all business students called always have a bat now. A BATNA is the best alternative to a negotiated settlement. And a BATNA is not just about understanding where you will go if your other side does not reach a successful conclusion. A BATNA is being comfortable with pursuing that end. To that end, and this is where game theory comes in. Most people know game theory. They know one very particular type of game theory. It's called the prisoner's dilemma. But game theory is very important in properly dealing with aggressive or important negotiations insofar as you should be trying to chart exactly what the outcome of your negotiations is, regardless of what happens on the other side. So it's almost like a chart. If that person does this, I do this. If that person does this, I do this. And you chart the whole thing out. You say, here are my three points that are important. If they say no, then I'm going to do this separately. And if they say no to this, then I'm going to do this. In other words, what you're doing is you are pre-cogging effectively the outcome understanding where you're going such that negotiations really become a tactic as to how you're going to achieve predetermined ends. And when dealing with aggressive players, if you can chart your course of action, which happens regardless of how they act, well, then all you're really doing is playing along and seeing where you go in your chart, not left alone and say, well, let's just see where this goes, which with an aggressive actor can be exceptionally difficult, particularly if you find yourself on the defense. But Jeff writes, to be clear, you respond to an aggressive party with aggression. I do, Jeff. When I have an aggressive party, I respond with aggression. Now, let me just be clear. I don't respond with overt aggression. I don't bare my teeth or anything else. But let me explain to you what I would mean by aggression. Let's say someone comes to the table and says, look, we're not interested in what you have to say. This is our position. This is it. My response I, I, and a non-aggressive response would be, well, OK, but you should understand that we have a whole series of things. And have you really considered what it is we're saying? Have you considered how we're going to deal with this? In other words, you're trying to find a middle ground. But they've already shown you an aggressive approach, Jeff, in the in the instance that I'm giving you. My response to them, if they sit there and say, there's nothing 
we we are absolutely dead set in our thing and everything else. You just look at them and say, okay, so then there's not really anything to discuss, is there? All right, very good. So I'm not sure why we had this meeting, um, but thank you very much. We'll move on. And you allow, and then you end your call. And it will eventually, then, then I'll explain to you why that's an effective tactic in a second. But what you're doing is if they if they are showing you that they are going to be obstinate, you too have to be obstinate. And by the way, getting back to the last point that I just brought up, your game theory chart should say, if they just aren't giving you nothing, you should be willing to walk away. And all I'm doing is following that, but using an aggressive tone in order to do it. Like, screw you, you're not ready to play ball. I'm taking my toys, I'm going home. That's what it is, okay? Okay, so let's keep on let's keep on going. Um, one of the things I just want to mention to the new negotiators on the channel, people who are new to real estate generally, that it's very easy for me to say that the best negotiators know where they're going from the outset, which is really my next point. But that is something born of experience. One of the things that makes my job really easy, because I negotiate every single day on behalf of clients, is actually understanding where the outcome is likely to reside. And so as an example, if someone turns to me and says, can you please negotiate with the builder for an extension, as an example, me basically saying, listen, I will be happy to negotiate with the builder for an extension, but be advised that these are the normal builder costs. They usually do not allow extensions at least without the following amounts of monies. And we're very and we do not have good negotiation leverage. We will have to accept this. So please, please, please get me your funds for the day of closing. What have I done? I have predetermined negotiations similar to the no, my initial inclination is no, but let me get back to you. I am preparing my side for the outcome that I know is likely to happen based on experience. And as a result, when I negotiate, I don't need to achieve a win. I've already defined what the outcome is, even if it's a loss. That's the expectation. Setting the expectation of your clients predicated upon your experience, which young people don't have, but older people do, is a critical component to actually being able to do negotiations. Because if you set what a win is in your client's mind and that win is achievable, then you are negotiating for a win in your client's eyes, even if it's only meeting halfway or even a quarter of the way. If, in fact, you do not have the benefit of experience and don't know where these things are going to end up, and all you say is, well, we'll see what the builder says when we, we'll get back to them. You have a very difficult conversation when the builder gets back and says, yes, please give us $15,000 and we're ready to go, right? Because the outcome is not something your client was prepared for. And as a result, successfully negotiating also involves prepping through experience and through knowledge your side with what the outcome is going to be expected to be. And by the way, once you actually have a good valiance on that, once you have a good insight into what the expectations will be, you basically can do your negotiations very quickly, always meeting your client's concerns and move on so that you are not constantly revisiting the same issues over and over and over again as your clients say, but why? This doesn't seem reasonable. I don't understand. You have already prepared them for the outcome and the outcome then is met. So experience particularly for those of you who are new at negotiations, you will find that experience becomes a, at first, I, I call it almost the, the ultimate crutch, but experience becomes the ultimate leg up that you have in making your negotiations sensible and orderly and above all, um, successful in your client's eyes because you start setting defined winnable objectives that you can win based on what your knowledge of the situation is. Um, okay, pausing. Anyone have any questions so far? Okay. From a perspective of uh, who you're negotiating with, I would point out to you 
that transactional negotiations with random third parties must be treated differently than negotiations with your long-term contracts, contacts. And the reason for that is that transactional relationships literally have one thing at stake. That is to say the outcome of what it is you're trying to achieve. Whereas relationship-based relationship negotiation, where as an example, Greg Whedon goes to court with the same people every single time. If Greg Whedon capitulates badly in one case, his reputation will then be as someone who capitulates. By the way, that's not Greg's reputation, but just I'm using him as an example. And as a result, it has long-term effect over his negotiation ethos with this person into many years. They will always remember that capitulation. They'll know that this is a person who might not make proper distinctions. And as a result, there are reasons to be much more guarded and delicate and think deeply with those people with whom you have ongoing negotiations, whereas transactional, as long as you get your win, however you get your win, you're fine. I know that this seems obvious, but I'm pointing it out to you because who you are negotiating with will also determine your strategy. I'm going to bring up something that every one of you who is a seasoned negotiator knows to be true. And every one of you who doesn't do seasoned negotiations won't believe. But I will tell you this from the bottom of my heart. 25 years of negotiation. This is what I do. Every, on any major negotiation, something where you have a $100,000 commission, something where you are negotiating the thing that matters the most to you, whatever that is, your, 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 your divorce, whatever it is. Walking away is part of the negotiation. It is not an end of the negotiation. Giving space, sorry, so walking away as part of Every negotiation is something you should learn to accept. When someone says they are walking, you need to understand that that does not mean that your negotiation is over. It might mean that you're taking a break for a couple of days. It does not mean your negotiation is over. It means that they're trying to make a point and see if your position is truly your position. Understanding that means that you yourself will dictate how you deal with someone walking away. Because of course, if someone says I'm walking away, I'm taking my toys and going home, you can say, well, screw you. That's it. Never coming back to this. This is your last chance. You can do that. But that would be a tactical error, knowing that walking away is part of the process. Instead, sitting there saying, I respect that. You're walking away because our side it has the following position. But I have to tell you that our side's position is such that you might have to walk away here. So why don't, you, why don't you walk away and just take a couple of days and think about it because we can't change our position in this regard. And I totally respect if there's not a deal to be had here. Even though you know in your head, yeah, 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 we're still negotiating. You're sitting there and saying to them, I get it. I respect what you're saying. Take your time. Door is open to coming back. Why? Because they definitely will come back. You both want something, some outcome. What they're doing is they're testing limits. Testing limits and making sure, particularly for your own client's sake, that you have gotten the maximum amount from everyone else in this negotiation is something people try to do. And walking away is the ultimate way to do that. I don't know why, but every serious single negotiation that I've had with serious six figures on the line has involved a walking away to the point where I wait for the walk away to know that I'm making progress. Anybody want to comment on that? Does anyone feel that what I'm saying has merit? Like anyone who's a seasoned negotiator, do you want to buttress my point or disregard, dis say that I'm wrong in my point? I don't think I am, but I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say because you guys are all seasoned at this too. Anyone? Jack believes I'm on point. Just to Jeff chime in, Mark. Yeah, please. Uh, the walk away is like 101 to any any negotiation where, you know, you need to send a message to bring things in line, you know? 
Totally. Like, like I, this number, number, uh, point number one with a client is a negotiation is not an event. It's a process. That's so exactly walking right. Away, it's using time, time as a tool, right? That's what the walk and it, away. It, it also means not only is it using time as a tool, it also means that you are truly exploring the points that, that will bring about a deal. You're truly now talking about those things that are critical to the deal. And people are testing their limits. So just be aware of that. Be aware that the walk away is a critical component of your negotiations. But thank you for that. Okay. Um, let's keep moving. Um, let's, um, okay. There are two points. There, there, for minor negotiations, um, minor transactional negotiations there are actually two approaches that i find help one is distraction and one is prioritization it is the case that oftentimes when you're trying to get a deal and not have your critical points realized by the other side distraction is a very good option so for instance, if you're negotiating an agreement of purchase and sale and you are in a power of sale position and you only have 35 days to close this before the lender takes over and the um, and the closing date is more than 35 days out, closing for you is a critical component of the negotiations. But if the other side finds out that there's a power of sale going on, that might directly affect um, what they are ready to offer on the property. And as a result, you may choose to make a list of 10 different things simply so that you're not calling attention to the fact that the closing date is there. And when you talk about the closing date, say, yeah, my client, yeah, but listen, it's much more preferable if they can just do it in 20 days. You know, they might even be willing to take like $5,000 less just because they have to move and this, that, the other. But because you've listed it in a list of 10 different things, it's not highlighted as the most important thing. Distraction is therefore the way of dissuading people from actually understanding what your critical priority is. That's different than a serious negotiation where you're not playing those games. You're trying to get priorities. When you negotiate with a builder during your 10 day cooling off period, technically I can put in 17 different points in the agreement, but if a builder sees 17 different points, they're much more likely to simply say no to all, just accept the agreement or lose. Whereas if I put in one or two points, that's something that they can probably turn their attention to. They're going to sit there and say, okay, what are these two points? All right, fine, let's give it to them. Prioritization matters in that instance. Distraction matters in the as instance of the closing date example that I gave. And as a result, you really need to figure out what your tactical approach is based on what you are negotiating as part of any transactional uh, negotiation. And the last point that I want to make before I turn it over to questions, and this is a large one, is how to negotiate. In order to, this is not a simple answer. How to negotiate requires you to understand what your own core strengths are. So as an example, I've thought a lot about what makes me a good negotiator. Mine, my core strength is thinking quickly on my feet. For me, therefore, in a negotiation, turning to someone and say, you tell me what your issues are, is a very effective strategy to start negotiations, both because I get to hear what their points are, and I always like hearing their points, but also because being a bit quick in negotiations, I am able to mark and note while they speak what they are trying to anchor, that is to say where they're trying to position, making a list of the position and refute it when it's my turn to speak. I feel very confident that I can understand what they're saying, that I can distill what they're saying into bullet points, and that I can refute that whilst actually coming up with my own positions, because that's my skill set. There are other people who have a skill set that is different than my own. They think very deeply about problems. They think very concertedly about where something will go. 
And for those people, perhaps starting a negotiation themselves, such that they can define the terms of reference that will be discussed is more advantageous. Knowing who you are is cr and your skill sets are critical to understanding how you choose to negotiate things. I know one person who finds that they play a great game of offense, and thus he does everything to keep the focus. This is his negotiation strategy firmly on the other side's pressure points at all times, bringing up their pain points over and over and over again. Why? Because by acknowledging their pain points, he's putting them into a defensive approach where they have to say, no, that's not our pain point. No, we're fine with this. We're fine with that. And what he's doing is he's concentrating on an offensive strategy because he knows he's good in that environment. Similarly, we had talked about those actors that are good in chaos and thus put people into chaotic environments because they realize that that's their core strength. Thinking deeply about what your core strength is whether it's planning, whether it's thinking on your feet, whether it's being aggressive, whether it's being nice, whether it is actually bringing in confusion or, or a whole range of other approaches that weren't even considered. All of these things, if you realize that that's your core strength, you must try to attenuate the negotiation to playing to them. And that's something no one can really tell you other than to say, consider what your core strengths are. You know yourself better than anyone else. And I would tell you this, we're all in the game of negotiation and every one of us has self-doubt. There's none of us that don't have self-doubt. Every single one of us that's sitting there on these forums and saying, this is what you need to do and saying, listen to me, I'm a big person or whatever it is. Every one of us is thinking, but am I really right? Oh God, I don't wanna be proven wrong. What's happening? We are all beset with the same self-doubt that you have in your head where you're thinking to yourself, oh, I hate negotiations. I can't let anyone know that I hate negotiations. I hate adversarial stuff. This makes my skin crawl. And yet you sit there and you actually put yourself forward. We all are beset with those predilections. Know that. And as you kind of develop in your career, figure out where you are least uncomfortable, which will eventually become your core strengths. And those core strengths eventually allow you to dance, play, have experience, guide your clients towards ends that are achievable, and fundamentally allow you to negotiate like a professional. So those are the points that I had. Again, I had a very funny PowerPoint for this whole thing as well. I'm a bit disappointed that you had to stare at my face this whole time, but there it is. So I'm going to open it up to questions for five minutes and then we'll call it a day. Who has what questions? I know this is not legal. This is more soft skills, but there it is. Christine writes, one of my biggest pet peeves in negotiations is when the opposing side takes a position, example price, but does not back it up. Is that a negotiation tactic, not backing it up? It happens all the time these days. So what I'm assuming you're talking about, Christine, is someone says, well, here's the price we want for the property. And you say, well, where are your comparables? And they say, we don't have comparables. This is it, right? Is that is that correct? Okay, so yes, that's what's going on. So remember, if you're dealing with someone who's irrational or aggressive, engaging with them in their world may be a tax error. That is to say, if they sit there and say the price, then and you really want the house, you don't want to walk away, then you sit there and say, look, if we're just going to pull numbers out of a hat, then I will bring you an offer and we can talk. And then you just bring a number out of a hat. And when she says, where did you get this from? Or when they say, where did you get this from? You say, well, the same place you got your price. Look, you want to have a serious discussion about this stuff? Great but then it has to be based on market reality. Otherwise, we're just pulling numbers. And as you see, it's not gonna get us anywhere. And the number you really wanna pull out of a hat, by the way, is half of, uh, is something that will land you in the middle. So if they say $2 million is what I want for a house that's worth 1.5, you would then bring them an offer of $1 million saying to them, listen, your $2 million is off base, mine is one. We're going to end up at 1.5 here. And it's ridiculous that we're starting at this approach and that you're making me do it this way. So if you'd like to have a real discussion about this and have real numbers, I'm open to that. Failing that, 
here's the negotiation and we'll have the back and forth that will ultimately end up in the same territory as had we had a negotiation that was sensible from the outset. Does that make sense, Christine? That's an aggressive response to what is effectively a response. Okay. And Kirk says a good response is the how-to retort. How can we pay that much without evidence to support that valuation? That's true, Kirk. You can do the how-to retort, but what you're actually doing, if you think about your retort, is you're actually trying to find a way to support their insanity. If someone is being insane, you need to show insanity to boot. Not say, show me why you're not insane. No, call them out. You're insane, I'll be insane. It's a better strategy because that will bring them to heal. Um, yeah, you absolutely can do both. You're absolutely right, Kirk. Uh, totally, totally correct on that. Vladimir writes, I'm very cautious with the takeaway close. I, I don't understand what that means, Vladimir. Do you want to just unmute yourself and just explain? Sorry, what do you mean by the takeaway close? Uh, takeaway in one of my sales trainings, we talk about when, you know, you give somebody a puppy and then you're going to, you know, take it away and say, no, nah, you know what, this is not for you. Um, so takeaway is kind of like walk away. You have to assess a number of different factors. You you need to know if they're saying, like you said, if they're if they're really irrational or if they're just playing irrational. Correct. Uh, you also you also want to be very clear the instructions you get from your client because you may lean to one uh, type of positional bargaining, and your client may uh, not really approve that. They really really want that house. Um, I've had clients that told me, don't even dare try and get, you know, 10 grand less than what, you know, whatever it is. We want that house no matter what. So, you know, I put my hands up in the air and they say, I'll do what you want. So there's a number of things that you want to assess before you go with the uh, walk away close. Yeah, you're, you're totally you're totally correct about that. And to be clear, we are all agents and uh, even lawyers. Lawyers are agents to their clients as well. And agents are down by down by the duty of obedience. And if your clients are giving you direct instructions, you can give your best advice predicated upon a deep understanding of negotiation. But that doesn't mean that they have to listen. And if they give you instructions, you must follow. Absolutely. That's totally correct, Vlad. Uh, any other questions? Any tips for commission negotiating for listening, for listings? Um, <laughs> I'm going to leave that for your brokerage. That's... Uh, that's really, you, you, you can take all the general tips that we've put together here and use them to negotiate, but I don't have any specific tips as to how to negotiate your commission. That's that's a bit beyond my ballywick. Go ahead, Sandra. Yes. Uh, can you touch a bit upon um, realtors actually, you started there saying that they are agents for the owner. They need to be aware that whatever they promise or state during a negotiation can actually have repercussions in court. There was one where it was a multiple offer. This will be coming to court. Multiple offer, and the agent was trying to get the price up. So the people, the buyers came up, and then the listing agent went back to them and said, no, someone else is higher. If you come up, we're not accepting your offer of X. Someone else has offered more, and if you beat that, then uh, you will win. And they just said at that point, no, we're leaving. And the agent later on that night uh, realized that his tactic didn't work and he actually signed their original offer. And now there's a legal battle going on of whether it's valid or not. Yeah, this is this speaks to and, you know, it might actually pay, behoove us as a group to actually do um, uh, the basics of agency, because people don't seem to realize that there is a duty of indemnity and obedience and the indemnity means that you are acting directly for your clients and your and and you are bound you're binding your clients to whatever it is you say as if they say it um and as a result in something like that instance that you just brought up where someone is going ahead and saying no we're not ready to accept you are binding your clients to saying no we're not ready to accept whereas you might not just think you're negotiating so yes the duty of agency is intricately tied to your role as a negotiator, because whereas you may not know the proper thing to do, it doesn't mean you're authorized to do it. And it doesn't mean that your client is, and Vlad brought this up too, doesn't mean that you are 
being granted the right to do it, you need to make sure that you are clear with your clients that you are doing things and that you have their permission, else you'll find yourself in court exactly as you described. Sandra, do you have another question or is that was that it? Uh, your hand is still up. That's it, sorry. That's it, sorry. Okay. That's it, sorry. That's it, sorry. Yeah, good, good point. Okay, guys, a lot of time for one last question. Um... <laughs> Jack, Jack asks in a direct message, so it's not supposed to be there. If you're not playing Enter Sandman as background music while negotiating, you're doing it wrong. Jack, I can definitively say if you're not playing Enter Sandman as background music generally while working, you're just not enjoying yourself. So, so that's that, that's a fair question. All right. Any any last real questions? Please. Last one. Nope. Okay. Guys, thank you. It is 11 o'clock. We've spent an hour. I hope you found this useful, even without the PowerPoint. Um, and I will be posting this uh, for everyone uh, on the forums very shortly. Thank you all. Mark, and Mark can will... you still, Mark, thanks again. Yeah. Can you still post the PowerPoint if you fix it? I, think I will. I'm going to figure. I think it's still on my laptop, which is when I did my last revision. So if I get if I get that fixed PowerPoint, I will put it up. I I actually worked pretty hard at making people laugh for this one. Yeah, so I'm that, that, I'm that's why I'm I'm curious. Yeah, I really want to see the PowerPoint. Thanks uh, a lot. I will. I will. If I if I have the PowerPoint when I get home tonight, I will definitely post it. You you can just post to people who attended. That will be fine too. So we will keep it to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, guys. My best. Have a great Thanks. day. Bye bye. bye. Thank you.